I'm Brian De Los Santos, host of How to LA. Join me for a conversation with artist River Garza about how we navigate our various identities in this city. It's May 18th at the Audrey Museum. Get tickets at elias.com slash events. Hi, this is Larry Mantle, and I'm excited to invite you to LA's Night at Dodger Stadium on June 23rd. Get your pair of tickets by supporting all the programming you value from LA's. Donate now at LA's.com slash Dodgers. Thank you. LA's Studios. Today on the L.A. Report, California's Reparations Task Force is out with its final list of recommendations. An L.A. museum opens a new exhibit looking back at Hollywood in the House Un-American Activities Committee. And school kids are learning about an Asian-American photographer who captured moments in history. Without these pictures, we wouldn't have any proof, no knowledge of any of this happening. Good morning, it's Monday, May 8th. I'm Suzanne Watley, and you're listening to the L.A. Report from L.A.ist 89.3. California's nine-member reparations task force has approved final recommendations for the state to compensate black residents for generational harm caused by discriminatory laws and practices. L.A.ist reporter Jill Replogle has more. The group's 95 recommendations are based on a detailed accounting of discrimination in the areas of voting, housing, and disproportionate policing and incarceration. One recommendation would create a new agency meant to help descendants of enslaved people calculate what California owes them in compensation. The task force estimates that an African-American resident over 70 years of age could receive payments upwards of a million dollars. But it'll ultimately be up to state legislators to decide whether and how the recommendations become law. The committee will meet one final time on June 29th before sending the recommendations to the state legislature ahead of a July 1st deadline. For LAist 89.3, I'm Jill Replogal. People who live in San Bernardino County and who have been impacted by the winter storms have until tomorrow to apply for CalFresh food benefits. Applicants will be vetted by the county. Those who meet the requirements will receive an EBT card that can be used to buy food at grocery stores and farmers markets. The legislature has approved $150 million in funding to help hospitals across the state that are in dire financial straits. Ana Ibarra reports for CalMatters. The new loan program comes after the closure of Madera Community Hospital in the San Joaquin Valley and after at least seven other facilities statewide have publicly discussed their financial struggles. The loans will be available through an application process. To qualify, hospitals will have to prove that they need the money and that they have a clear plan for recovery. Hospitals in trouble tend to serve low-income communities, and several of them are located in rural areas, meaning access to care is already limited. Legislators recognize this program may be just a short-term fix. Hospitals say they will need more support in the upcoming budget to truly make a dent in their financial strains. In Bakersfield, I'm Ana Ibarra. Governor Gavin Newsom will need to sign the bill into law to enact the new loan program. The city of Long Beach has launched its Bike Share for All program that lets local residents apply for memberships for just $5 a year. The program allows people to pick up bicycles at any self-serve bike share hub and later return the bicycle to any hub or public bike rack. The program is open for anyone 18 years and older who work, live, or attend school in Long Beach and can show proof of low-income status. The applications can be found at the city of Long Beach's website. Coming up, kids are learning about prominent Asian Americans and those lesser known who've made significant contributions to the culture. Support for LAS comes from the UCLA Technology Development Group, presenting LA Best, an LA Bioscience and Ecosystem Summit on Thursday, May 25th. LA Best brings together investors, industry leaders, researchers, educators, and students for a day of presentation and discussion about the newest discoveries in life science. Information at tdg.ucla.edu. This podcast is supported by Foothill Transit, who is greening big with the largest fleet of new hydrogen fuel cell buses in North America. You can be among the first to experience the power of hydrogen with its quieter and cleaner ride. More information about Foothill Transit's commitment to sustainability and their move toward a zero emissions bus fleet at foothilltransit.org slash greening big. 
Back now to the L.A. Report. Children around the country are marking Asian Pacific American Heritage Month by learning about famous people such as Anna Mae Wong and Jeremy Lin. But L.A.S. correspondent Josie Wong says lesser-known figures, including the late influential photographer Corky Lee, are starting to get their due. Fourth graders at LA's California Creative Learning Academy have been studying Corky Lee's work for months. Griffin Gerland says he's most struck by Lee's images of Asian Americans protesting discrimination and police brutality. Without these pictures, we wouldn't have any proof, no knowledge of any of this happening, and it really made an impact on the world. Lee, who died in 2021 of COVID-19, had joked he was the unofficial Asian American photographer laureate. But it was pretty close to the truth. He was there when protests broke out in Detroit in the 1980s, after Vincent Chin's killers were allowed to walk. After 9-11, Lee took a famous photo of a sick man wrapped in an American flag. For LAist 89.3, I'm Josie Huang. A new exhibit at the Skirball Cultural Center in Los Angeles examines a difficult time in U.S. history. In 1947, the House Un-American Activities Committee called on Hollywood figures, including many prominent names, to testify to the panel about allegations of communist propaganda in films. Those who refused to testify suffered lasting repercussions. The exhibit is called Blacklist, the Hollywood Red Scare. Here's the coordinating curator, Kate Thurston. The fear of not working, of you losing your livelihood, was profound. And the impact that had was silence. It silenced people. It had a chilling effect on opposition to the House on American Activities. The multimedia exhibit features correspondence, personal items, and film from that period and will be open through September 3rd. The Los Angeles County Fair opened over the weekend. It offers three more weeks for people to enjoy the rides, the petting zoo, the deep-fried carnival food. The fair dates were moved two years ago from the scorching heat of September to the cooler temperatures of May. A few things to know before you go. Fairplex in Pomona is closed Monday through Wednesday except for Memorial Day, which is the final day of the fair. And the cheapest tickets are on Thursdays, just $15. Weekend prices are slightly more, and concert performances require Require a separate admission fee. You'll see a bit more night through morning clouds lingering into the afternoons by tomorrow and Wednesday with some light showers or drizzle across Southern California. Temperatures will remain below average for this time of year through Wednesday, and then you can expect a warming trend to take shape toward late in the week, especially away from the coast. Thanks for listening to the LA Report. The AM edition is hosted by me, Suzanne Watley, and produced by Michael Cosentino, with assistance from producer Tyler Wayne. Our engineer is Brandon Bowles. Catherine Mailhouse is the Director of Content Development. Check back here at 4 for the PM edition. You can read more at LAist.com or listen live anytime on the LAist app or on the radio at 89.3 FM. Listeners like you help make the LA Report possible. Please donate at laist.com slash join. And the LA Report is supported by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe quality journalism makes Southern California a better place to live. Ma, pa, te presento a mi novia Luna. Hola, mucho gusto. Eric Galindo, co-host of Wild here, and this season, I'm going to tell you a fictional love story. The type of story that feels like a movie. It was inspired by my life. The woman I was dating, off and on again for a minute, comes to me and says she wants to move to Milwaukee. You're looking at the newest anchor for YWCC News, baby! I'm going to be the face of Milwaukee's leading news source. It was a road trip adventure across America. I was steeped in love and in one of the most confusing relationships of my life. This is a Southeast LA rom-com. It's the kind of fictional audio drama that forces you to confront parts of yourself. From LA Studios, listen to Wild Season 2, I Think I'm Falling in Love. Catch the new season on NPR One, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts.